Good morning. If you have your Bibles, turn with me to Galatians chapter 3. We're going to be in verses 6 through 14 this morning. We are continuing our sermon series in the book of Galatians entitled Finding Freedom. And in this series, we've been talking about what it means for the gospel of Jesus Christ to bring true freedom to our lives. And so maybe you're someone that's joining us for the first time. I want to encourage you to check out the, the archives of this sermon series that you can find on our website because it's been a great series that we've been learning about what it looks like for the gospel to bring freedom to our lives. And so as we dive into our text this morning, we're going to be looking at this idea of what it means for us to find freedom through this text this morning. So if you would turn with me to Galatians chapter 3, verses 6 through 14. Here's what the word of the Lord says. It says this, Just as Abraham believed God, and it was counted to him as righteousness, know then that it is those of faith who are the sons of Abraham. In the scripture, foreseeing that God would justify the Gentiles by faith, preached the gospel beforehand to Abraham, saying, In you shall all the nations be blessed. So then, those who are of faith are blessed along with Abraham, the man of faith. For all who rely on the works of the law are under a curse, for it is written, Cursed be everyone who does not abide by all things written in the book of the law, and do them. Now it is evident that no one is justified before God by the law, for the righteous shall live by faith. But the law is not of faith, rather the one who does them shall live by them. Christ redeemed us from the curse of the law by becoming a curse for us, for it is written, Cursed is everyone who is hanged on a tree, so that in Christ Jesus the blessing of Abraham might come to the Gentiles so that we might receive the promised spirit through faith. I want to tag the text for our exchange this morning, Living by Faith. What Paul's getting at here through this text is this idea that we are called to live by faith. It's this idea that we've been justified by faith through Jesus, and now we have this ability to live by faith because of that. Paul's talking to an audience that's still struggling through this idea of what it means to live the justified life through faith. They wanted to add so many different things to the gospel, and they did not want to believe that you can just live by faith and faith alone is sufficient to bring about salvation. And so we're going to see that in our passage this morning, this idea of living by faith. And so friends, as we walk through this text, you should ponder to yourself, am I living by faith? Am I trusting God to provide the means of justification for my own life? Or am I looking towards other things in my life? Am I looking towards my own works or am I placing my hope in Jesus? That leads us to point number one this morning. Living by faith is the pathway to righteousness. Living by faith is the pathway to righteousness. We're picking up in verse six here. This is what it says. It says, just as Abraham believed God and it was counted to him as righteousness. See, what, what's happening here in this text? It says, Abraham believed God. What does it mean for him to believe God in this text? In, in the original language, he's saying something intentional here. There's a sense of reliability, of trustworthiness that is coming out of this word believe in this, this language. And so this idea of us placing our faith in God is, is undergirded by this idea of us relying upon him, us trusting him. Have you ever met a friend sometime that you maybe didn't know beforehand or you didn't have any familiarity with, but once you met them, you realize that they are a trustworthy and reliable person? Maybe that was how it was for you with your spouse. You met your spouse for the first time. That's how it was for me. And when I met my spouse, I realized that she is a reliable and trustworthy person. It was some, somewhat of comfort there that I could believe in her, knowing that she's going to be able to have my back. In the same way, in this text, this idea is being communicated that if we believe in God, that is going to be counted to us as righteousness. We are saying that God is trustworthy, that he is a strong haven that we can place our hope in. So yes, it might look different for you to trust someone else or to find them reliable, but God is someone that you can find as a haven. You can put your all-consuming hope in him. Your friends, your family, members might fail you, but God will not. Abraham believed God and it was counted to him as righteousness. This passage does not say that Abraham was 
obedient and it was counted to him as righteousness, but it says that he believed God. It's this idea of faith that is being communicated here. And here's something that we need to think about for a moment as Christians. It's really easy for us to be tempted to say, well, when I am obedient, then I will have faith. But we're getting it the wrong way if that's what we believe. See, faith leads to obedience. It, it, it draws us towards obedience. But obedience does not give you faith. It's faith that always proceeds obedience. Friends, how have you thought through that idea? As we walk through this text, I think some of these things that are kind of going through Abraham's mind might change your perspective of even the Old Testament or even what faith looks like. Because Abraham was encountered by God, and God came to him, he trusted him. He, had his, he places faith in God in those moments. We see that Abraham's works did not make him righteous, but he trusted the, the promises of God. And it was through him trusting the promises of God, of, of who God is and what God was going to accomplish in his life, that he was made righteous. We see that idea in Genesis chapter 12, verses 1 through 4. Here's what it says. It says, Now the Lord said to Abram, Go from your country and from your kindred and from your father's house to the land that I will show you. And I will make of you a great nation, and I will bless you and make your name great so that you will be a blessing. I will bless those who bless you, and him who dishonors you I will curse. And in you all the families of the earth shall be blessed. So Abram went, and as the Lord had told him, um, told him, and Lot went with him. And Abram was 75 years old, and when he departed from Haran. What we have happening in this text is really crucial. You might have noticed one thing that's kind of funny. He goes by Abram at first. This is before he trusted God and believed God. And so in, it's in this moment that God is communicating to him that eventually that God is going to start calling him Abraham instead. And so that's just a note, something to, to write down in your Bible. There's a difference here. But what we see happening is this, is that Abraham is given a promise in this text that God is going to work in his life and that God is going to, to bless his family. He's going to make them a great nation. Th that's a big deal. And so when God says that he's going to do something in our lives, we need to trust him and we need to believe him that he's going to do it. So you might be thinking, well, Abraham didn't have Jesus, so how did he have faith? No, he trusted God's promises. He knew that God was going to bring about a people and it was going to come through his family. Could you imagine how much trust that would take? See, believing in God, that he's reliable and trustworthy, is essential to faith. It, it takes faith to believe that, that he is a promise-keeping God, that he's going to fulfill all these things in your life. So Abraham did not understand the, the nuances of God's promise to him. He didn't understand what it was going to look like for his family to, to grow and to, to develop and for the nations to be blessed. You might want to try to say, well, that's maybe a blind faith. No, no, no. He's talking to the God of the universe. It's not blind faith. He didn't know where God was going to take him, but he trusted God. He did not know what it meant for God to make him a great nation, but he was willing to trust the God of the nation to, to build his people and his nation. But what he did know was this, that the God of the universe was talking to him, and he was calling him towards faith to trust him. And because it was God who was talking to him, he wanted to trust God. See, faith is not about understanding, but it's about trust. Faith is about understanding. Not about understanding, but it's about trust. There are some of us who need to understand every single thing before you're willing to trust something. It's kind of like we really just got to question God and really figure out, God, should I really trust you? To some extent, extent it's like we want to play 21 questions with God. Why, God? Why should we do this? Why, why should we go? Are you sure that's a good plan? It's kind of like we treat God as if we're a three-year-old. You know, you've, you've interacted with a three-year-old before when they just kept asking you why, 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 why. But that's sometimes how we treat faith. We believe for us to trust the promises of God, we need to be able to question those promises. But here's the thing. When you actually believe God for who he is, you see him as reliable and trustworthy. When you trust God, you are trusting someone who is greater than you. Friends, do you believe that today? Do you actually believe that God is greater than you? Sometimes it's hard for us to come to those types of terms that, that God might know what's good for our lives in a, in a different way than, than we can even conceive for ourselves. 
He, he might have greater plans for us than you could ever imagine. I can only imagine being Abraham in this moment. God comes to him and says, I'm going to do a great thing through your family to bless the nations. He had no idea what God had in store for him. See, did you not know that when we trust God, we're, we're placing our confidence in him? And see, this is what we need to do. We need to place our confidence in God so we can trust him to, to move in our lives. See, God, what he's doing is he's calling you to radical obedience. This is different than this idea of obedience leads to faith, but he's calling you to radical obedience. Why? Because he's the God of the universe. He's given to you his promises so that we can trust him in radical obedience. So radical obedience through faith is different than obedience through works. Radical obedience is more about the God of your faith than the production of your works. See, radical obedience is about trusting God as the storyteller of the gospel to your life. Therefore, you are willing to follow him wherever he is calling you to go. Why? Because you know who the redeemer of your soul is. You know who the one that's going to bring about redemption to the world, the one that's going to bless the nations, the one that's going to make his people a multitude. See, that's what Abraham was banking on in this text. He was trusting God for who he was. He, he knew that he could place his confidence in God. But friends, have you thought about this? Are you willing to place your faith in God and to trust him and know that that's the path towards righteousness? Not knowing what is going to be around the corner, but you just want to trust God for who he is. Friends, will you trust him? Because it's only through faith in him that you will be counted righteous. And so that's where we're going to eventually see that we're actually connected with this family. So even as Abraham places faith in God, we too are brought into the family of God that gets to move forward following God for forevermore. This leads me to point number two this morning. Living by faith connects us to the family of God. Living by faith connects us to the family of God. Let's read verses 7 through 9 again. It says this. It says, Know then that it is those of faith who are sons of Abraham. And the scripture, foreseeing that God would justify the Gentiles by faith, preached the gospel beforehand to Abraham, saying, In you shall all the nations be blessed. So then, those who are of faith are blessed along with Abraham, the man of faith. So check this. If righteousness comes through faith, all people are recipients of righteousness through faith. So so what, what the author's trying to do here, he's trying to show us that your faith is not separated from the faith of the people of God throughout history. And it's so easy for us to want to separate ourselves from them because we we think that they're light years away from us. But Paul is communicating to the church of Galatia how to determine if someone is actually a son of Abraham. And, And this was crucial to this time period because sons of Abraham did not believe in works based salvation, but salvation through faith alone. And what was happening in this community is that everyone was trying to to, to curate the gospel. They were trying to say, no, 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 we are faithful to the Old Testament saints in their beliefs about faith. And so what Paul is doing here is saying, no, 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 no. Salvation through faith alone is Abraham's faith. And if you want to be brought into the, the sons of Abraham, this family that, that God is building, it's through faith alone. So this is why he's using the Old Testament saints as an example here. See, Old Testament saints were saved by faith, not by works. And that is a crucial distinction that we need to make. Because some of us, we read the Old Testament, we start to believe that, okay, well, it was just their obedience to the law, and that's how they came to faith. They were just faithful in obedience, and that was it. But no, from the beginning, faith has been at the central um, nucleus of God's promises to his people. It's faith that is what God is calling people towards. See, we misread the Old Testament because we do not comprehend the purpose of the law in faith. And we're not going to be able to talk about the purpose of the law as much today, but we're going to get to that next week. But in verse 7, it gives us confidence that we know that we are a part of the family of God through faith. People in the Old Testament um, did some boneheaded things. So when you're thinking about their lives and how they live by faith, and maybe you're thinking, well, Maybe shouldn't it have been by their works because we saw all the bad things that they have done? So, for example, you might think of a guy like David, good old homewrecker David, the guy who really messed a few different things up. And it's pretty clear there that he, 
He did some bad things. But we see, though, that the reason why that God still moves and he still works is because of faith. It's faith that saves David. It wasn't his actions. If it was his actions, he wouldn't be saved. But it's through his faith in God, his heart that went after God. See, friends, when we read the Old Testament, we think of these people as these these great exemplars, these people that are, are perfect people, but these are broken people just like you and I. David made mistakes. Abraham made mistakes. Noah made mistakes. I could go on down a whole entire list of these Old Testament figures and characters that have made these mistakes throughout history. But that doesn't mean that it was by their works that they were saved, but it's through faith. And that should be relatable to us. Friends, that should be so encouraging for you because you are like the broken people of the Old Testament who could not live up to the law because the law was never meant to save them, but it was meant to point them to the God of their worship. Friends, when you make mistakes, God disciplines you. He points you towards the gospel, towards the cross of Christ from where his redemption comes from. But even in those moments when you make mistakes, he's trying to point you towards worshiping him. See, the law was meant to keep us from sin, not produce a works-based salvation. In some way, the Galatians, some of them got it twisted. They wanted to revert back to a works-based type of salvation that wasn't even the faith of Abraham's son. See, friends, we should be grateful that our merit before God is not based on our works because just like the Old Testament saints, we would never measure up. Even someone like King David couldn't measure up. But God was gracious. God still worked in his life. And you see, that's how we're connected to these people. See, faith connects us to the people that went before us. In the Abrahamic covenant, the scriptures are showing to us that God was preparing Israel for the day that he would bring the Gentiles into God's family. See, this is how the gospel was preached to Abraham. Because the gospel was preached because this this blessing that would come to this nation was going to happen through Jesus. It was through Jesus going to the cross that these people would be brought into this great family. Not by their works, but through faith in whom? Jesus. See, the people that God has been building is this mosaic of a people that are living by faith together. And that's the people of God. Galatians chapter 3, verse 14 helps to solidify this idea. It says, so that in Christ Jesus, the blessing of Abraham might come to the Gentiles so that we might receive the promised spirit through faith. The promised spirit through faith. It's through Jesus that we get to receive the spirit through faith. See, God's going to bring redemption to the nations through Jesus. And that is glorious news that even though we're broken people, God's going to unite us to him. It's our faith in Jesus that connects us to the people of God. That leads me to point number three this morning. Living by faith is about abiding in Christ, not your works. Living by faith is about abiding in Christ, not your works. Some very interesting things happening in this next section of Scripture. It says, For all who rely on the works of the law are under a curse, for it is written, Cursed be everyone who does not abide by all things written in the book of the law and do them. Now it is evident that no one is justified before God by the law, for the righteous shall live by faith. But the law is not of faith, rather the one who does them shall live by them. Let's pick up in verse 10. In verse 10 we see that Paul says, All who rely on the works of the law are under a curse. You might be thinking, are you serious, Clark? We're really going here today? God's talking about curses here in the New Testament. We're supposed to just to trust God. Is, is God really loving if he's talking about cursing people? Well, we need to understand the context of this passage to understand what's happening. This might seem odd to you, but that Paul would start talking about blessings and curses. However, it's not odd because the Jews would be very familiar with this idea of blessings and curses from the book of Deuteronomy. In Deuteronomy, God introduces the idea of blessings and curses. And what he does is this, is that God gave the law to Israel to help them to follow him. That was the purpose of the law. He told them if they obeyed the law, they would be blessed. But if they disobeyed the law, they would be cursed. 
What he's trying to do here, he's trying to communicate this idea that there's going to be consequences towards your lack of worship of God. It's going to impact your life. And so this is God trying to protect his people in these moments from themselves. Because if they just ran rampant in their sin, they would bring more destruction upon themselves. And so it's not necessarily God is inflicting it on them, but they're bringing about it themselves through their own actions and the causes and ramifications of their sin. So what Paul is doing here is he's trying to remind them of what had happened before. But I do want to make this note. In this moment, Israel is under a theocracy, which means God is at the helm of their nation. So there is a direct correlation between God speaking to his people in this moment, directing them as a nation state. And so there's some differences here from then our time and then their time, but these laws were expected to be obeyed by Israel. This is God telling them how they should live in this community that God has created for them to dwell in. So it's God who's implementing these laws for the purpose of them worshiping him. So Paul's reminding the Judaizers about this, because if they want to actually live like the Israelites, they need to be willing to to abide by the consequences of being an Israelite. And and that's a clear distinction. If you're going to put yourself under the law and you're going to take on that weight, you better be willing to deal with the consequences of the reality when you're not going to measure up. That's what he's trying to get at here. That it wasn't like the law was just some like nilly-willy thing that they just subscribed to, but it's something that actually held them accountable. There would be ramifications if they did not live up to it. Here Paul is quoting Deuteronomy 27, verse 26. Cursed be anyone who does not confirm, uh, confirm the words of this law by doing them. And all the people shall say, Amen. It's this idea that the people of God collectively will hold each other accountable to be obedient to God's words. And and the the people of God in this nation state were going to affirm this. See, God is setting aside a way of life for them to help them to worship him. Therefore, if the Galatians are going to live by the law, they must be fully committed to obeying the law. And Paul is clear here to make sure that we know that this is true for both Jews and Gentiles. It doesn't matter who you are. If you're going to put yourself under the law, You better obey it fully. Here's the reality. No one can obey the law to perfection. Only Jesus can do that. But in verse 11, we see that no one is justified by works, but through faith in Jesus. See, so when someone comes to faith, they are united to God through Christ and his death, his burial, and resurrection. And so when you're seeking to obey God and remain faithful to him in obedience, it, you're doing so through your union with Christ through faith, not through your obedience to the law. And there's a big difference there. So when we have faith, we're united with Christ in a very intentional way. And this is this idea that, that Paul's trying to communicate here. We need to abide in, in Jesus, and that's the way that we're going to be faithful to God. The law has no place in this conversation. It's the lifestyle of abiding in Jesus that shows us what it looks like to actually to live by faith. Friends, are you abiding in Jesus? Are you actually seeking to live by faith because your trust is in Jesus and what he's done to bring about faith in your life? Are you trying to rely on your own works? Friends, when you are abiding in Jesus, you're finding rest in Jesus for his work that he has accomplished on the cross. Friends, we have so much that we should be praising Jesus for because he's done all the work for us. We just have to abide in him. And don't think that your act of abiding in him is a sense of a work, because it's not. Because Christ has already done that work for you on the cross. Living by faith is not about perfection, but brokenness that is experiencing redemption. Living by faith is about placing your hope in the one who can actually redeem you. Friends, that's what it means to abide in Christ. You're placing your hope in the one that can actually redeem your life. Are you abiding in him? You should, because it's going to allow you to rest in him for who he truly is. And that leads me to the fourth point this morning. I know some of y'all are like, what, four points this morning? No, nah, I'm going there. Bear with me. Point number four is this. Living by faith allows us to rest in Christ's perfect obedience. Living by faith allows us to rest in Christ's perfect obedience. Let's look at these last few verses. Christ redeemed us from the curse of the law by becoming a curse for us. For it is written, Cursed is everyone hanged on a tree. 
so that in Christ Jesus the blessing of Abraham might come to the Gentiles so that we might receive the promised spirit through faith. Without the ability to remain compliant to the law, we needed someone to intercede on our behalf. And maybe you're not a, a Christian, maybe you're a skeptic, or maybe you're just wondering about why we actually follow Jesus. But that, that reality is true for all of us. None of us could measure up, and we needed someone to intercede on our behalf. We need someone to take our place and, and, and go before us, and that's Jesus and him alone. Have you ever worked a job and you've maybe struggled to remain compliant to all the procedures and laws and principles that are set before you at your job? You, you're trying as hard as you can, but every time that you try, you just keep failing. I, I had that happen before where I was working a job earlier on in life, and um, I was trying to get acquainted with the job, and it became harder and harder to make sure that I did everything on the checklist. I felt like every week I was maybe forgetting something. In the same way, the law set before us, and we were never meant to measure up, but it's as if someone came in and said, I will take care of the checklist for you. I will intercede on your behalf. Even though there's a curse that you probably should bear, I'll bear it for you. That's what Jesus has done for us on the cross. So it's only Christ who can redeem us from the curse of the law by becoming the perfect sacrifice on our behalf. So you are able to live by faith alone in this reality of Christ being the sacrifice for you. Nothing else can be that sacrifice. You have to run to Christ and trust him, abide in him. See, the law was purposed to help us to worship God and to expose our sin, and Christ sacrificed himself rightly so that we could actually worship God in a right way so that he could redeem us from all of our sin. See, Christ is the one who's interceding on our behalf, and he's redeeming all those things that have been broken in the world. But as we think about this idea, you might think, well, we've heard about this before. But this text is getting at something a little bit different than we see in some other gospel accounts. Because it wasn't just an easy task. This curse, blessing language is used here, but someone had to bear the curse that you deserved. And that's Christ. See, Christ bore the weight of our sin and the curse that we deserve so that we could be united with God. We can't think that that was just an easy task for Christ. If we do, do that, we're, we're kind of belittling Christ's work for us on the cross. Maybe it can come off as if we are entitled to it, that we just deserve it, that that's all that we um, have desired in life and we, we're getting what we, we deserve. But that shouldn't be in our minds. That should be the furthest thing from our minds. We should be grateful for what Christ has done. Matthew chapter 27, verse 46, is very helpful in us considering what is considered the cry of deliriction, which means Christ's abandonment in this text. Here's what it says. In about the ninth hour, Jesus cried out with a loud voice saying, Eli, Eli, lemma sabachthani, that is, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? It was in this moment that Christ felt that weight of that separation from God. They call it this, this abandonment in this moment where he's bearing the weight of the sin of the world, that curse that you deserve to bear. And he's feeling the weight of that pressure, your sin. The weight that's been on your shoulders, being lifted off of your shoulders and being placed on Christ on the cross. But if it wasn't for Christ bearing this curse on our behalf, there would be no way for atonement. See, Christ provided this atonement from the curse of sin and obedience to the law. It's Christ bearing this curse of him mitigating us from what we deserve to inherit. It's because of our sin that we deserve to get what's happening to us. But Jesus in his grace bears it all for us on the cross. So when we talk about this idea at New Valley that Jesus is in our place, it's in view of the cross of Christ. It's in light of him bearing the, the curse of the law on himself doing it so that you and I could, could have life. If you notice in verse 13, it says, 
Cursed is everyone who is hanged on a tree. I think it's interesting here that Paul seeks to bring this out because no one wants to die by being hung on a tree. I don't think there's anybody throughout human history who's saying, that's the way I want to go. But in this moment, he's trying to communicate something very intentional because contextually, within the Old Testament, there's some roots here. Because after someone died who had broken the law, they would, be, they would put them on a tree or a post to make a public declaration of their disobedience. Put that in light of what happened to Christ and how that could even signify something for the Jewish people in this moment. Friends, this idea of, of killing someone and putting them on a tree or a post is not something that's even foreign to us, even within our American context. So it happened in Israel, it happened in the American context, we know that it's, a, it's an awful way to kill somebody. There's a sense of curse with it. Ah, uh, they're, they're not worth that much. They deserve to be humiliated. So understand that contextually in this moment. As the Israelites are reflecting on the cross of Christ, Christ is taking one of the most humiliating types of death that could be imagined in this culture because they're putting him on the cross. And not only did they just kill him first and then put him on the cross, but they killed him on the cross. But Christ went through this humiliation for us. He did all this to pay our debt. The debt of the weight of our sin that we deserve to bear, he bore it on his back on our behalf. The crucifixion is one of the, the worst forms of capital punishment, and the Jews knew it. But at least in their culture, they would say we, we would have killed him first before we would have put him on the post. So that's why it's so significant here that Christ was killed on a tree and what that would do for them in their contemporary moment. But friends, it does something for us too. 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 24 says this. He says, he himself bore our sins in his body on the tree, that tree. That tree that we talk about 2,000 years later. That, that tree where our hope comes from. What does the text say? It says that we might die to sin and live to righteousness. So that you will look at the tree and that you would have faith and that you would trust God because you can find rest in that old rugged cross. That old rugged tree that people would look at and say, oh, that's just a busted down tree. But no, that tree is from where our help comes from. And what does that text say at the end of it? It says, by his wounds you have been healed. Even though he was beaten, battered on that old rugged cross, you can be healed through redemption through Jesus. What was meant for his humiliation is meant for your victory. Friends, if that does not get you excited, it gives you something to praise God about because what they meant to destroy him meant to liberate you. What they meant to, to humiliate them, they used to bring you to be the person that you can be now through Jesus. God's using all those things through his spirit. If you trust him in faith, that you believe that what Christ has done for you was actually for your behalf. That it's actually Jesus in your place. See, Christ was the perfect sacrifice for you. You don't have to do the work yourself anymore, but you can now have living faith through Jesus. You can trust him in your life. He's reliable. He's trustworthy. Friends, do you have a living faith? Do you have a faith that is unwavering, secure in the cross of Christ? Do you have a faith that's clinging to the promises of God? Does your faith find God trustworthy for all that He has promised and accomplished for you? Friends, what is stopping you from having that type of faith? In God, that faith that I mentioned earlier that leads to radical obedience because you know who your Savior is, you know who your Redeemer is, and you know that you can move forward clinging to faith because you know what Jesus has done for you. Friends, if you're not a follower of Jesus today, I pray that you would be encouraged 
through the, the preaching of the gospel. But here's my, my big prayer for you. Is that you won't wait till tomorrow, but today you will make a decision to place your faith in Christ. You will believe that he is the one that can bring about living faith because you trust what he has accomplished for you on Calvary. Even though you've tried to measure up in this world, even though you failed many times, you can place your faith in the one who has never failed you, and that is God. God showed his love for you on the cross, and it ran red for you. Friends, place your hope in the cross of Christ today. If you want to take that step and follow Jesus, I want to encourage you to go to our website, www.newvalleychurch.com, and I want to encourage you to reach out to someone about what it looks like to place your faith in Jesus. We have this tab that's called Jesus in My Place. I want you to click on that, and I want you to get in contact with someone who can share with you what it looks like to follow Jesus and to have a living faith. Let me pray for us. Father, we're so grateful for the cross of Christ. We don't know where we would be at without you, but we're so grateful that we can have living faith because, Father, you bore the curse on our behalf through your son, Jesus. Father, what they meant to destroy us, Father, you meant for our good. What they thought would discourage us, you used to encourage us. So, Father, I pray that we would just trust you and we will follow you faithfully for the rest of our lives, knowing that we have a living faith, one that is undefiled. But, Father, also I want to, to lift up anyone right now that's contemplating whether or not they have faith, whether or not they believe that you are reliable and trustworthy. Father, I pray that you would just work in them right now and that you would draw them closer to yourself. And, Father, that you would just encourage them to take that step to have a conversation with someone about what it looks like to follow you. Father, thank you for, for Jesus. Thank you for the cross. We're grateful for it. All this is in your name we pray. Amen.